My name is Namdi Ele. I'm the head of School of Architecture and Planning at the at Vits. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to this event this evening. Um, the second year architectural representation electives exhibition has traditionally been held uh, in contact spaces in the John Moffat foyer at the close of the first semester. But uh, this year, we are doing it online. We are proud to be able to open this exhibition tonight in an online format, as we feel it is important to acknowledge the achievements of our students and to give them the platform to showcase the excellent work that they do. None of this would have been possible without the uh, attention, specific attention of my colleagues, in particular, uh, Sally Gall, Doug Bauman, and Patricia Theron, uh, all of whom have pulled together uh, an onerous task in order to bring this event to this point. I would also uh, like to thank tonight's guest speaker, Peter De Yeager, for sharing her knowledge with us this evening. It is an honor. Peta is an architect and she works within the CSI, CSIR's Smart Places Cluster. Her research interests include health and the built environment, engineering and design approaches to infection transmission and mitigation, climate responsive design, implementation support to government, and capacity development. She will be speaking to us about the topic COVID in the African city, speculations and provocations on future roles for architects. There couldn't be a better topic to kickstart an exhibition opening than this. Colleagues, students, uh, guests, uh, practitioners uh, in the field, please welcome the guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. So um, as it's been mentioned, um, I'm Peter de Yaga. A year ago, um, Professor Bob Scholes invited me to present to a meeting of the Pan-African College of Sustainable Cities. Bob has subsequently passed away and today in tribute to him, I revisit the presentation which explored themes of informality, the African city, COVID-19 agency and transformational leadership. The original presentation was prepared with input from my fellow architects acknowledged here. I'll paint a scene in caricature, a story of potential using drama, brazen exaggeration and outrageous generalization. My task is, my self-appointed task, is to provoke. So when a movie was made of Nick Remender's graphic novel, The Last Days of American Crime, a story of dystopia set in the USA, it was filmed in Johannesburg and Cape Town because these cities provided a convenient backdrop of spaces plausible as post-apocalyptic mayhem. An African film made, an American film made in Africa. Ironically, on the other hand, Bern and Zana, the mythical city, uh, phantogasmical city in the mythical state of Wakanda, shown at right, is the quintessential African utopia. According to the legend of this city is a product of Africa, but in reality, the images are concocted and manufactured in the detached studios of Hollywood. We will revisit these two images of place at the conclusion of this presentation. As it appears that COVID-19 is new and the title mentions speculation that the topic choice is opportunistic or that my extensive use of popular cultural imagery, comics and logos makes it flippant, I want to briefly outline my story as a, as a journey as an architect, and this hopefully will reassure you that health, the built environment and leadership are much more than of just casual interest to me. When I graduated from WITS in 1995, South Africa was at the dawn of democracy. Political uncertainty and a flight of capital left little construction investment and little opportunity for a young architect. 
An important exception was in the specialist field of hospital architecture because, nervous about a potential collapse in public health, demand for private need, uh, private uh, care suddenly burgeoned, bringing with it infrastructure needs and opportunity. What began serendipitously over time cemented into an enduring professional fascination. I gradually migrated from the private sector to the public sector and joined the CSR to work on a number of very interesting projects. Uh, we defined norms and standards for healthcare infrastructure, and we thoroughly investigated how building design and engineering can be used in a systematic and evidence-based way to mitigate risk, for example, risks of disease transmission. I'm going to share a little bit with you about some work that we did in TB infection control. To set the scene, this was uh, 2006, um, there was a, an outbreak of an extensively drug resistant TB in Tugela Ferry in KZN at the Church of Scotland Hospital. 266 people in the community contracted uh, extensively drug resistant TB, which is um, resistant to most of the drugs known to treat TB. Uh, and 205 had uh, uh, multi-drug resistant TB, which is only slightly uh, less deadly. More than 84% of the people who contracted these uh, drug resistant forms of TB uh, perished. Um, and there was concern because uh, this disease is, um, is spread via the airborne route uh, and the infrastructure that was there to be to, uh, pro pro provided for the care of TB patients was inadequate uh, to deal with the risks um, and to deal and to accommodate uh, what was seen as a massive epidemic at the time. So the CSR got uh, some grant funding from the Global Fund, and we uh, did a number of um, of TB drug resistant TB units across the country. Uh, we were uh, played the capacity of client advisor, um, and we worked with consultants who then went about um, doing the detailed design. So this is an example of one of the facilities that was built, and it was this one is in Morimoli in Limpopo, um, and you can see that it's a it's got a 32 bed male and a 20 bed female intensive phase cluster, and there were um, other clusters and uh, a pharmacy that was also attached to an existing hospital. The existing hospital had big open shared bed wards, which are sort of typical of old um, uh, hospitals. Um, and, and you can immediately see uh, from this uh, diagram um, that w our strategy was uh, to put a nursing station, which is shown in blue, very separately from patient rooms, and each patient had a separate room. So this, the nursing station still has good control and visibility uh, so that it can it can um, offer patient care, but it's separated physically in space, meaning that um, the risk of uh, infection is massively re reduced. Um, so here's a, a, a diagram of a single patient room layout. And um, you can see that these are actually, each room has got its own ablution facility. So simply by the spatial layout, we were already addressing infection prevention and control to some large extent. Then we used computational fluid dynamics to model how air would flow through this building because it was going to be these uh, buildings because they were going to be naturally ventilated. And we used that to inform much of the detail of the design. For example, the roof monitors. The early designs we found the, roof, the, the air was simply um, going through, through that roof structure and not actually uh, impacting on, on the quality of air within the room. Um, and so what we, and the other thing that we know is that patient behavior matters. So people are inclined to close windows and so on. So we, we made sure that we had um, uh, um, details or under the eaves that made sure that there was always ventilation, irrespective of whether or not patients closed their windows. Um, and then there were some questions around whether this would work. Moli Moli is quite um, wind still, and you know, it was it was it worked exceptionally well. We went and did measurements post occupancy, and the the ventilation rates um, were excellent, um, ma much more than than um, are needed by building regulations, and really a very good technique um, to to uh, mitigate risk of infection by the airborne route. 
also the the floors had un, the solar um, heated underfloor heating uh, in order to to um, get the air also to move through the facility uh, to generate uh, pressure differentials across the room. We took a detailed look at which window would be the most um, effective and we found that a, a center hinged pivot window would work. So these are very technical solutions, but we were very um, mindful of the quality of patient environment the architects positioned the buildings carefully around the existing trees. So very soon after the facility was um, opened, it had beautiful gardens. And then we introduced an art project um, incorporating, uh, you, you know, uh, involving the patients in the facility because they were going to move from one facility to the other. Um, we, gave, we found materials as part of the, the contract, the building contract, um, we worked, we got volunteers from the CSIR and from uh, various other organizations, and we worked with the patients to, to make these beautiful mosaics, which we then incorporated into the building fabric. Um, so that that's essentially uh, one of the examples of things that, that we did. So um, just... Um, um, all right, so... Following uh, episodes of thinking about hospital as a machine for healing in the in the modern era of health healthcare architecture, um, architects approached its ta the task of hospital uh, architecture as a field of inquiry, trying to emulate medical research it served, and and that was this idea of scientific evidence base as a driver of design, and it achieved some modest success. For example, proving using replicatable scientific methods that patient healing is very much improved by the provision of natural light and ventilation. Now, establishing such causal relationships in the field of architecture is actually quite rare. Many of our claims about the effects of our, uh, infrastructure on humans, for example, its influence on behavior, can't actually be demonstrated in ways that pass muster. Uh, remain in the realm of conjecture, might be exaggerated and are certainly challengeable. So healthcare architecture enthusiasts recognized, luckily, the average person doesn't spend terribly much time in hospital facilities um, and that productivity, wellness, health and so on are achieved in the hours spent in the built environment at large, which can um, support or thwart human, human well-being. Here's a picture of a Blue Hills of a sequence of drive through uh, fast food restaurants we have KFC drive through McDonald's drive through and a Nando's drive through all in one frame. Um, and uh, such an urban arrangement could actually be anywhere. Um, and what it does is it crowds out opportunities to walk and play or to choose different lifestyles. It's difficult to be immersed, especially if these are in your formative years in an environment like this, which is without rationally concluding that one needs a car and needs to surrender to consumer culture in order to navigate and, and succeed in contemporary society. So developers rather than architects lead generally in developments like these. But let's take a look at some important features of how our built in uh, urban environments are produced and reproduced. So South Africans build, uh, building industry is formidable. It's a, a value chain uh, which spans regulation, planning, design, materials, uh, manufacture and logistics, construction, maintenance, operation and then recycling. The South African construction sector is significant. It contributes nearly 19, uh, nearly 20 percent of GDP um, and the, the public sector investment contributes 6 percent of that. Sector employment exceeds 1.4 million people. So um, as the rail players here are identified on the right, they're, they're extensive. Um, but ultimately, every one of us is a stakeholder in the built environment. The spaces we make and the spaces we fail to make are the spaces we inhabit and the edifices or wastelands we bequeath to subsequent generations. We have an extensive regulatory environment in South Africa. Listed here are some, but by no means all of our applicable laws. Over time, 
the means of producing and reproducing architecture has become progressively more complex task. Linen, ink and set squares have given way to Revit and BIM 360. Blueprints can be prepared anywhere in the world. Buildings can be conceived, visualized and prepared, disconnected from physical reality, disconnected from the people who, who will occupy them. Now, these regimes comprising networked enterprises of role players, regulations and these practices at least ostensibly are in place for rational and noble reasons and based on evolution from accumulated learning and experience in order to ensure public safety, quality, to assign rights and responsibilities to specific people and, and uh, entities, uh, to promote equity, governance, transparency and so on and so on. The result is a complex ecosystem which leads to regimes which produce and reproduce the building environment in pretty much predictable ways. I've mentioned this commercial space example. Here's another example. A significant part of the regime in South Africa is the, the uh, BNG or more commonly known as the RDP housing program, which is delivered by the machinery of the state. Mostly these are spatially, socially or structurally estranged from urban centers and also disconnected from the rural economy. The classic South African township is not able to access benefit afforded by either, rendering them marginally viable and vulnerable, but dignified in nevertheless and desirable nevertheless. According to government, since the dawn of democracy, 4.7 million housing opportunities have been created. That is an impressive a number. Um, in 1994, that was when I graduated, housing backlogs, or just before I graduated, housing backlogs were estimated to be about 1.5 million units. And by 2017, that need had grown to 2.3. Given that we've produced the 4.7 million housing opportunities in the meantime, we're going backwards quite quickly. The cost in addressing housing backlogs by 2020 was estimated to at about 800 billion and the annual budget for the human settlements program, including electrification and water programs, was less than 8%. People are left behind, unable or occasionally unwilling to participate in the formal regime. Exclusion results. The built environment is a sponge soaking up citizens and holding them invisible in its folds until it can no longer hold them. Here is an aerial view of Crossroads in 2011, and you'll see it, there's a large tract of open land in the middle of the space. So that's 2011. On 10th of August 2014, the same tract of land, we see a few formal, informal structures on the right lower corner. 10 days later, the whole open area is occupied and four years after that, the settlement has consolidated further. I'll go back through it. Look at this transformation. Look at, notice how it intensifies a physical manifestation of a failure to anticipate and accommodate the needs of young people growing up and needing to take up a place in society. 13% of our people live in informal settlements and backyard shacks. Architects rarely bring their talents to the production of these self-help structures. Not substantively involved in the production of factories, repeat commercial ventures like the drive-throughs, informal settlements or RDP houses. So where are the architects? Architects are where the resources are. Serving corporations in Santon. Here we're looking at the Discovery Building. Uh, the wealthy individuals in gated communities. Here's a speculative house for... Um, Waterfall Park, Waterfall Estate, um, <clears throat> and building occasional public works. This is uh, Buchetman and Partners uh, Department of uh, Fish, uh, Forestry, Fisheries and Environmental uh, and, in, and the Environment, um, and a, an award-winning six-star, uh, green-star rated building. Um, so architects have very important skills and talents to bring to the built environment more generally, but they have failed to identify ways of playing outside the regime um, reproduced from its roots in Reba. 
uh, construction is a tough game, the construction mafia um, contesting territory and various other players. So even when architects are involved in the production of built environment, outside the remission of gated communities and big business enterprise, they're not always hitting the right notes. This is an image of the Red Location Museum um, and some drawings by the architects of uh, the peop uh, of the um, Red Location Museum of the People's Struggle in one of the displaced settlements in Kabeja, a Noera Wolf uh, architects won the commission to a design competition and then subsequently won an, a number of prestigious international architectural design and leadership awards for these buildings. The hosting community, though, was not impressed. Um, they vandalized the structure, dubbing it a house for the dead, and the facility is closed. In March 2020, like most of the rest of the world, South African state took unprecedented steps, declaring a state of disaster, locking down citizens. In an effort to tackle this invisible enemy, the world stopped in its tracks, yielding images like this, of a homeless, seemingly bewildered woman in Johannesburg. Now, we know quite a bit about how coronavirus transmission happens, uh, mostly via droplets, which are shared from infectious people talking, singing, breathing, and so on, uh, which then find opportunity in the mucosa of susceptible individuals uh, to, rep to replicate repeatedly so that the disease propagates. Accumulating local and international lessons over centuries from various poxes, plagues, outbreaks and epidemics, society has developed a toolbox of globally recognized and well-established strategies to address these risks. I won't go into detail, but it's based on a systematic, structured approach using a basket of measures in a hierarchical manner to interrupt the cycle of infection. These measures work synergistically and although risk cannot be eradicated in this way it is hoped that it will be managed we can show that the built environment can act to amplify transmission and it can be designed and engineered to mitigate risk for coronavirus we have opportunities available at various scales which we can bring to bear at the urban scale we can look at zoning enclosure amenity and we can install ICT networks. The build at the sorry at the urban scale at the building scale, uh, we we can look at how bar barriers, thresholds, uh, programs and sequence programming and sequencing uh, can work with uh, work to mitigate uh, risk of infection. And we can develop look at the building envelope design. These are some of the things that we we, we were mentioning in ter in in reference to the uh, TB. Um, work that we were doing before. And at the scale of the room, you can look at size, the layout, how furnishing works, noise management, yes, even noise management, uh, ventilation, and, the, and then the installation of devices which uh, are meant also to, to mitigate risks such as ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. This immediately raises some challenges. In the lower right hand corner, um, we look at ideas about vigilance and um, uh, we can use technology to, to surveil people, but we need to ask questions about what level of surveillance we are prepared to accept as society and where it becomes invasive uh, and uh, um, controlling. The other issue is um, if you look at the right side, we're looking at the manual of physical distancing, which proposes um, very clinically how we can uh, space people within classrooms um, in ways that make the space uh, safe. The question is, um, how does that get implemented under the constraints of our real world conditions and African institutions? So frankly, in general, the processes of formation and transformation of the built environment are too slow and cumbersome to react rapidly in real time in a meaningful way to the immediate needs, even though in some ways it may be implicated in transmission and even though it may carry effective technical solutions to contribute positively to the fight. 
predictably, it is not the built environment that is being shown up as the game changer. It is the pharmaceutical intervention in the form of vaccine. The fight isn't over yet, but perhaps this astonishing photo from Wimbledon just last month is a glimpse of a more normal future. An interesting question is, when the immediate risk of coronavirus abates, will it have been a catalyst for change? Will we return substantively to how things were before? What will be different? COVID-19 is a global catastrophe with no nation remaining untouched. To quote a very tired cliche, although we are all facing the same storm, we're experiencing it from different boats. An interesting anecdote on this image is that it's a, a, play, a, a temporary camp that was set up under hard lockdown uh, for placing um, homeless people. Now, the one uh, co uh, carte blanche uh, presented a program explaining how this was really a wonderful thing that for homeless people because there was a, a space for them to receive um, nutrition and care and also to to be removed from the temptations and the availability of drugs and other substances. Um, and, and they were positing this as a very uh, positive thing. But the people at this Cape Town um, facility were calling it a prison um, and threatening to burn it down. So, um, same storm, different boat. Um, to illustrate that we are experiencing this indeed uh, uh, from different boats, I'd like to sketch out the mechanics of how already being disadvantaged, say in an informal settlement setting, can deeply uh, can deepen even further under the coronavirus stressor with reference to a basket of specific recognised mitigation measures. OK, so if you're in an informal settlement, um, we know that uh, avoiding close contact is recommended, but how do you do that if you share accommodation? It's impossible. How do you homeschool um, people if you have no devices, no connectivity in your settlement, and your own schooling is limited? How do you stay at home uh, if your culture is about Ubuntu and socialization? How do you open windows if you have no windows or if opening your windows compromises your security? How do you maintain a strong m m uh, immune system by good diet and exercise if you have a very limited budget and no immediate food sources available? You implement frequent wa hand washing, surface disinfection and mask laundering where you don't have um, your own tap. Uh, taps and, uh, and running water and sanitation in your settlement? How do you maintain chronic health services if, you're, if your um, clinic is a minibus taxi ride away where you're going to expose others as you travel? How do you avoid contact with wastewater, fecal matter and safely dispose of tissues, etc., where sanitation services do not exist? And how do you stay at home if your livelihood depends on going out on a daily basis? So these, these are ways in which um, being already disadvantaged further deepens under such a stressor. Before we jump to a conclusion that density is necessarily a problem and that we should then spread everybody out, we need to be mindful that statistical analysis do not show a consistent connection between big city density and coronavirus impacts. So some of the mo world's most heavily settled places have proven to be the most formidable in containing virus. There are advantages to density. Density means cities can more easily concentrate resources and social services where they're needed. Residents, in theory at least, have quicker access to healthcare services, and when nurtured by social infrastructure, um, they tend to sometimes be more resilient to the effects of disaster. South Africa is one of the most unequal societies in the world. Inequalities are physically expressed in the fabric of our cities and towns. Here we have the architectural, se architecturally segregated communities of Masipumelele, 
on the left and Lake Michelle right near Cape Town. Such disparity breeds discontent, frustration and conflict. I won't say anything about the recent um, looting. With coronavirus and unrest, a lot of people are appealing to government to do something. What could they do? They can use epidemiology and spatial data to identify vulnerable co uh, communities and to target in interventions. We can use technology to track uh, service delivery real time uh, and we can there, thereby hold government to account. We can ask government to ramp up efforts to sort out the housing backlog and to provide emergency shelter and relief. But even as government is publicly celebrating its accomplishment in these very interventions that we're asking for on the backs of many hardworking officials, here delivering temporary wooden houses in Bilgespreit in record time and under lockdown conditions, the media are asking provocative questions. Are our state authorities using COVID-19 as a justification for forced eviction of informal settlement residents? As well, they should. In the early 1900s, first Cape Town and then Kabecha and later Johannesburg and Durban had vicious outbreaks of the bubonic plague. Using a need to decongest and sanitize to prevent the plague spreading as its justification, the authorities of the day forcefully removed non-white populations en masse from the city centers to be on the outskirts in temporary accommodation, which was later to become permanent, raising the original homes and destroying personal belongings. The suddenness and urgency of the changes was explained as to be driven by the emergency nature of the plague and built on fear. This premise of public health to segregate and relocate populations along racialized lines was repeated again in the Spanish flu epidemic. Disease and epidemiology was a mean for so, means for social scapegoating, stigmatizing and pathologizing, which congealed in the imagination as social metaphor for blackness as unsanitariness. And this foreshadowed legislation like the Land Act, the Housing Act, Group Areas Act, etc., which emerged finally as apartheid ideology and dropped the health pretext. So, what has the effect been uh, on COVID of COVID nineteen been on imagining and reimagining the built environment? So COVID-19 has reminded us of the beauty and significance of the fresh air, nature and the non-built environment. People are social creatures. Lockdown, especially a hard lockdown under sustained isolation, brings anxiousness and loneliness and anxiety and loneliness. In the early days of COVID, 19 saw people spontaneously interacting at a distance via balconies and strips, resulting in some spontaneous rituals of engagement and entertainment. The safe spaces of celebration, mourning, gathering and ritual have been reimagined. Here is an alternative to a Zoom wedding. Instead of erasure and displacement, there are alternatives for upgrading and edifying settlements in situ. Policy is in place to do this, but the approach, uh, the, is, this approach is uh, the state is uh, the state is ill-equipped uh, to accomplish. But maybe this is good work for architects. This is this particular project is a reblocking project in Kyalicha used to densify and improve existing uh, circumstances, but with options for the units to be modified, expanded and consolidated over time. In the reblocking project, the infrastructure uh, provides uh, opportunity for home businesses, thereby integrating sustainable livelihoods into living spaces. Unlike the RDP approach, this Kyalicha project, a one size fits all solution is not presumed. To promote good infrastructure, we can pay attention to the quality of light, ventilation design, and the needs for safety and security as a design problem nexus. 
We can look at thresholds and their role in transitioning from public to private realms and the supplement, uh, supplementing nutrition in integrating urban agriculture. We can look at the way in which sanitation is relegated to the inside and back of buildings and remem uh, remember to make clean water part of the front of the building and in public spaces. We can revis revisit the ideas of passive surveillance shared in communal spaces and their role in reducing anxiety and in, in building community. Um, we can insist on public spaces that don't drive out anyone who doesn't drive, which are free, fun and engaging. At the 2021 in international, oh, um, and then there's this concept of inclusive activism, uh, which is an idea from Portugal on how to work with inbuilt environments to accommodate migrant workers in dignity and to upgrade um, uh, involving the community itself, but with the aid of an architect. At the 2021 International Architecture Exhibition, La Benial de Venezia, Omar Renia de Graaf presented an installation titled Hospital of the Future. The installation considers the trajectory of medical processes and technical advancements. The designer speculates that the hospital of the future is a place medical practitioners will never go to, places that will act remotely and treat each patient individually. Hospitals of the future will be self-sufficient, similar to how greenhouses produce their own crop. The newly imagined spaces will allow automatic, automated machinery to handle routine tasks instead of its staff, leaving precision work in the hands of devices. Closer to home, COVID-19 has prompted us to reimagine the role of the home. Home is isolated and safe from the dangers outside. Home is now connected always to the outside. It's where the, where the Wi-Fi is. It's where the, it, home is now where your school is, where your university is, where your work is. But what does this do to your privacy? to your physiological and your psychological health. So COVID-19 has been an acute disruptor, wreaking havoc to individuals, families, communities, businesses, governments and economies. The production of the built environment depends on the ability to obtain materials which must be abstracted, uh, extracted from a finite endowment and refined or procured under conditions of scarce resources. This affects the number of plans passed on the X axis and the time on the Y axis. The signature shows an industry from the birth of democracy to today, which is incredibly volatile with major shocks like COVID-19 here clearly visible. But it also tells a story of growth as well as it should. South Africa's population is currently 60 million or so, and it's set to grow to a about 80 million in 2050, which is the professional lifetime of the second year students. Population growth is, a, is like a force of nature, and this can bring with it opportunities for growth, especially as these populations move from rural to urban settings. So Gills and Schott propose a model for transformational change like this. It develops a multi-level perspective. Landscape eff uh, effects are the features which are the long-term drivers of change. Things like economics, materials, climate change and population growth. In the middle tier is a dynamically stable regime, a system of networked enterprises and royal players, regulations, practices, which produce and reproduce our cities in the forms we recognize. Then there are the niches, which are the experiments, the disruptions, the fresh ideas, which resonate with the changing landscape, which bump up against the stable regime, take root and thrive. The world is transformed, one experiment, one idea, one sketch, one artifact, one story at a time. The images I've chosen have been, been dramatic and crass for effect. The images were taken from the internet from open source. Uh, they are recorded here. Um, this exposes me to be a bit of a less than an ideal role model, 
um, because my work is then derivative and architects should ooze originality. And it's also rather backwards looking uh, is because the core of architecture should really be to look forward. So what can we say about the future? Well, um, I'm going to end by sketching caricatures of three possible futures. Uh, none of these will manif manifest in pure form, of course. <clears throat> but here we go. So if the current regime rules, the blueprints of informal settlements, BNG houses, drive through McDonald drive throughs and Santon, uh, et cetera, gate, gated communities and so on will prevail if no heed is paid to the natural force of population growth and opportunities that can bring, then the built environment will take strain and crumble in a gritty future portrayed in the likes of the last days of American crime. Or it can manifest some kind of a wonder like Wakanda, but conceived and made in Africa. The future is yet to be defined. And that is the task of the generation of the current cohort of architecture students and their peers across the land. According to the model shown, and I think it's a useful model, transformational change happens with niche experiments when good quality new ideas, new images, new artifacts and new narratives challenge and displace old regimes. As external examiner to the ARPL 2019 graphics course in 2021, I've been privileged to get a preview of the ideas, images, artifacts and stories of the second year graphics students, which will be shown on the exhibition. And the works contained in these portfolios are not crass and unoriginal like the images in my presentation. They demonstrate a keen desire to explore, to challenge and to create, and this bodes well for our future. I'd like to say thank you to the Bits School of Architecture and Planning, the organizers, and also especially to Sally, Dirk, Hugh, and the second year students for the opportunity.